and welcome to the Suicide Risk Awareness Prevention Symposium. I am Brigadier General Andrea Gail Bennett, retired. Today it is my honor to have been asked to say a few words for this important session. I'm disappointed that I cannot be with you in person, but at the same time, I'm excited for you and the great discussions you will have around suicide prevention to help save lives. As a career physician assistant and the former state surgeon of the Massachusetts Army National Guard, it has been an honor and a privilege for me to serve alongside the members of our Commonwealth's military forces. Over the past 20 years, our nation's military, including active duty, reserve, and the National Guard, have been called into service more than any time in recent history. Our military service members have performed multiple deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan, international peacekeeping missions, and for the National Guard, multiple domestic activations for severe weather events, natural disasters, and civil disorders. They have seen combat, experienced casualties, lost comrades, and been separated from their families for long periods of time. For too many of our veterans, the wounds of war remain long after the mission is over and they return home. Some injuries, physical injuries, are obvious and can be rehabilitated with medical care and the passage of time. But some injuries are hidden. The hidden wounds of war, post-traumatic stress, depression, anxiety, unresolved grief, are chronic, corrosive, and silent. And the problem is exacerbated by the demands of our military service to be strong, mission-focused, self-sufficient, courageous, and selfless. Those lived values contribute to mission success in the military, but unfortunately, they impede self-care for anyone who's struggling with personal problems. 22 a day is 22 too many. The hidden wounds are literally life-threatening. We cannot let our men and women become one of the 22. Every single day, we have 22 lives to save. Today, we have an opportunity to discuss the skill set that will matter in identifying an at-risk veteran and helping to save a life. You will learn the signs to look for. Hopelessness, anxiety, agitation, rage, alcohol or drug use, and withdrawing from family and friends, just to name a few. The first step in preventing veteran suicide is identifying the problem and intervening. Police officers, firefighters, medical professionals, school counselors, friends, neighbors, family members are all the people in our community who have the greatest opportunity to identify at-risk veterans and intervene. Today, you will discuss and learn reliable responses and coping mechanisms that you can use to intervene and assist a struggling veteran. You'll become carriers of this important information into the communities where you live and work. I want to say thank you to the American Legion Post uh, 373's Suicide Prevention Program for inviting me and my participation and granting me the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you for taking the time to do this important work today and every day. Thank you for showing veterans that we matter and that you got our six. Thank you. Um, we have a wonderful program here in North Central Mass that serves uh, our women veterans. And, and I think we all understand that women veterans, that their service and their needs have been um, uh, neglected 
for far too long. And that program is called uh, Alyssa's Place. And here to tell us more about it is, is Jackie Blanchard. Jackie is a, uh, can I say, proud veteran of the 747th MP company. And uh, she deployed to uh, Afghanistan in an OEF support mission. Did I get that right, Jackie? All right, Jackie, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Jackie, and I'm the program director at Alyssa's Place Peer Recovery Center in Gardner. And I'm also a woman in long-term recovery. So for me, what started as a uh, legit prescription for a five milligram Percocet ended with a needle in my arm. Uh, it also ended my brother's life, who his name was Adam, and he's also a veteran. Uh, he, he died of a drug overdose. Um, April 29th of 2015 and for me it was one of two choices either I you know instantly I wanted to go with him of course um, we were 19 months apart and I couldn't imagine living my life without my best friend but you know seeing my family and what that did to my family um, you know I stumbled across Alyssa's place and it was in its infancy it was about three weeks it had been started about three weeks and it was in the Gamma building in Gardner. And I stumbled in there for recovery yoga, which I don't even like yoga, but I just needed something. I, I don't even know why I walked in there. Um, and so I walked in there and I was just greeted with open arms. I was greeted with love, no judgment. Um, you know, I had already burned all the bridges from my family, rightfully so, you know, just empty promises and stuff. And these people just, no judgment, they just sort of loved me back to life. And through that, they gave me a volunteer position and they really didn't need me there. But what that did for me was that showed me that I was needed. And so for one day, I would make sure that I was sober. Like that was my goal for the day is like, I'm needed at this place, so I just can't get high today. And one day turned into two days and two turned into three. And then, then I was a peer leader there and, um, and now I'm the program director, so that's pretty cool. Um, I just celebrated seven years of sobriety in June. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, so Alyssa's place, uh, Alyssa's place started, uh, sh she passed away of a drug overdose at 20 years old, and um, her parents, they, they had to make the choice that she was in the hospital for those three days and they had to make the choice to pull the plug. And in that time, uh, her parents decided that her life wasn't gonna be in vain and that they wanted to create something with a bigger impact. And through that, they created, the AED Foundation was created, which is uh, Alyssa's initials, Alyssa Elizabeth Dunn. And it also stands for Assist, Educate, and Defeat. And through that, then they created a peer recovery center. Um, we got funded through Bureau of Substance Addiction Services and Department of Public Health in 2019. And we're located on 297 Central Street and Gardner. We're diagonal from MVOC and Gardner. Um, so some of the things that we do there, we, we hold different uh, support groups. We run an all recovery meeting every day at noontime. We have smart recovery, which is science-based. It's based more on CBT. We have a Dharma meeting, which is based on Buddhist principles. We have a recovery through Christ meeting, which is off based off the Bible. Uh, we have a codependent meeting. We also have yoga. We take them on all kinds of different trips and everything that we have is free. Nothing is through insurance because like I said, we're funded from BSAS. You could walk in, you, you could become a member or you could not become a member. And we also understand that meetings are not everybody's pathway, so we do not push that when someone walks through the door, they have to go into a meeting um, because that's not not really everyone's pathway. We try to we try to provide them with the connection. So what happens is someone comes through the door, and if they don't want to go to a meeting, they just they can sit on the couch, they can watch TV, they can play video games. We can also help them get resources for jobs, write resumes. We can do pretty much anything um, to try to help them, and every single person. Every single person's needs are different. Um, so we would love to see you there. If you have any questions, I, I'll be here for a little while. Also, uh, we also have resources for family members too, family members whose loved ones are struggling. And the other thing I just want to close with, you don't have to be sober to walk through that door. We just ask that you're not belligerent. Um, and we'll try to meet you where, where you're at and hopefully 
do what was done to me is try to love you back to life and let you see that you're worth it. So thank you so much. Next we have uh, Mr. David Sutton, who uh, represents, runs an agency called One Call Away out of Western Massachusetts, uh, providing uh, important assistance to PTSD, uh, so folks who are experiencing PTSD and self-harm issues. Dave, thank you. Damn, that's bright. How are you everybody doing today? I'm David Sutton. I'm the president and founder of the One Call Away Foundation where PTSD supports suicide intervention. We're located out of Southwick, Mass. with a veteran support center in Agawam, Mass. Where we house a facility where we have goods and services for veterans going through any kind of need, any kind of distress, or anything along those lines like that. Um, I've learned over the years at, at, at events along these things lines, it's best to always start off with a bit of a qualification session so you know who I am and where I'm coming from. Um, I was born, as you can all see, and uh, moved forward in life and got just as screwed up as most of you have and learned how to figure out a few things as I went. Uh, I come back after my tour and duty during the Cold War period and went back to my hometown and uh, began to self-destruct. Uh, I got into drugs and alcohol. I was a dealer. I was into all kinds of, all kinds of mischief, uh, and it was nuts. And uh, November of 1987, that was the end of my line. I went from being one of the biggest Coke dealers in Lumister to being one of the biggest users. I went from traveling around the, the, the different states to barely be able to get from my house to the package store. Uh, living on my mother's couch, my car was crashed on both ends. Didn't have a penny to put in my pocket. Didn't even know what a dime was. And uh, I was on a place called Massapog. It's in Lunenburg. 2.30 in the morning. And a bog is a, a mass that floats above the water. And there's life and there's space and there's stuff underneath there that makes grown men puke. And I was going to crawl into there at 2.30 in the morning. I was sitting on the hood of the car finishing my last cigarette. Had a note writ sitting on the seat. And uh, out of the dark, and it was a pitch black area, there was a voice that said, you know, Dave, there's a better way. I turned around and it was a Lunenburg police officer. There was two warrants for my arrest. I was driving unlicensed, unregistered, uninsured. There was no plate on the car. And he didn't mention any of that. He just, out of the dark, I heard, you know, Dave, there's a better way. You come walking up, and, and, I, and I finally got a look at his face with what, what light we had. And he proceeded at that point to tell me how he got sober six years earlier and wanted to know if I was interested in getting a cup of coffee and talking about it. There was something in his approach. There was something in the way that he spoke to me. There was something in his eye that gave me the ability in that moment to trust him, and I did. He walked me over to the cruiser, opened the passenger side door of the front seat, and let me sit inside and took me to Dunkin' Donuts and we got a coffee. And it was the most amazing thing that happened. I found a little bit of hope in the, in the eyes of somebody else who happened to be in law enforcement whose job was to take people like me away. But he found that there was something standing in front of him that was worth saving. He still took me to jail. Don't, don't make any mistake about that. <laughs> so I took the trip to the jail, and, and uh, then I ended up down here in, in Western Mass to the Western Mass Alcohol Correctional Center. And uh, that happened after arriving in the lower left down to Worcester County House of Correction. I got down here, and I was supposed to meet my counselor, and his name was Mike. And he only comes in on Sundays because he works somewhere else. Sunday morning rolled around. I'm waiting in front of his door. He never showed up. An hour later, they come down, told him he's not coming. I go back to my room. Following Sunday, same routine. So I finally get down there, and he's there. I walk into the office. I sit in the seat across from the desk, and he's sitting there with a folder open. And he's looking at it, and he looks up at me. And he's talking about trials and tribulations that happen, accidents and motor vehicles and drinking and drugging and feelings and emotions and all this crazy stuff and being arrested and, and uh, drugs. And, and I'm like, I'm thinking in my mind, you know, who the hell does this guy think he is? He doesn't know who the hell I am. How the hell can he sit there and look across that table and tell me how my life is? So he went on for about close to almost 30 minutes. And I was character assassinating this guy in my skull like you wouldn't believe. So when he finished, he looked up and he looked me in the eye and he says, that's what happened to me. What's your story? Yeah, that's what happened to me too. I went, ha, 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 ha. So the first night I got hope. 
Now I run into this guy, Mike, who taught me humility. Those are the two things that I needed most in my world at those points. Didn't realize I did. Didn't know I did. Nobody told me. Wasn't taught in school. Joel Sargent didn't speak it from Fort Benning. Took some trials and tribulations and some hard places to grow at. I had to figure that out. Coming up in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be sober 35 years because of those two people. I appreciate, I appreciate that. I really do. That's outstanding. Thank you. But I didn't do it. Because the first, the first uh, couple of months into my sobriety, my mother, she was killed in a car accident, had a heart attack behind the wheel, drove into a telephone pole. Spent three hours on the side of the road before somebody found her. Six months after that, my grandmother was hit by a UPS truck, who I grew up living with, up at Lake Samoset. Then my father died of cirrhosis of the liver in a cardboard box under a bridge. Then my grandfather died six months after that due to complications of surgery from a staph infection. And then the guy I cherished most in the world, my Uncle Billy, he died of cancer. And that happened all within three years. Now I say that, not so you'll feel sorry for me, but you'll understand this next point that I'm going to make. And is that my feet never touched the ground. When my friends that I, that I acquired when I moved down here found out what was going on in my world, they flocked to me. They picked me up off the ground and they carried me. Because there's no way in hell that I should have stayed sober during that period. Left on my own accord, I wouldn't have. I would have been right where I was. Those folks brought me where I needed to be, took me from where I shouldn't, and showed me that there was light at the end of the tunnel, and then they walked with me to get there. Now, I bring this to your attention only because of what I'm going to tell you next. That, like eight years ago, I joined the Patriot God Riders. I saw them in a the newspaper. I saw what they were doing for veterans, and I wanted to do something. And I said, this is something I can do. I love to ride motorcycles. I love veterans. I love the show on it. We're on as due. So I joined, and it was great. And it got to the point where one day we were at the Veterans Cemetery in Aguam, and uh, most of you have probably been there, know how it's set up. There's a chapel. You go in the front, and then you have the service inside. You have the big window you look out, and then you have the back door you leave. Well, I had done quite a few missions with the Patriot Guide Riders, and we do a, when we have something going on, we have a, a pre-mission briefing where our ride captain will instruct us to what's going on, why we're there, who the person was, a bit about them, and we get a lot of information that the public doesn't get. Well, on this day here, the, the family had come from far away. There was no, there was no hearse. There was no, there was no trail of cars. Uh, they showed up separately. We were staged at the back door, so we didn't see who went in the front door. There was 10 of us there with American flags and a Marine flag for the representing the individual that was being, being buried that day. So as, as the service went on, we could hear them inside. The, you know, the taps went off. The guns were fired. The final prayers were said. The back doors opened up. People started to filter their way out to passing the last, the last respects as they come out the door. And we didn't know who was in there. But we were there to show honor. It didn't matter to us who it was. But we found out real fast. Last one walked out the door carrying the flag as the closest member of the family. This happened to be a young lady, a little girl, who was burying her husband who couldn't find a better way. There was 10 men standing back there, not a dry eye in the bunch. I left there that day, distraught, crying, figuring, you know, why couldn't somebody come out of the dark on his day and say, you know what, there's a better way? And also being a man of faith, I said to myself, you know, listen to that voice inside your head that there is something you can do. Take what you've been through. Take what you've learned and give it to somebody else because to whom much is given, much is expected. And I live by that. Another one I learned to live by when we started one call away is that I can't, but we can. That is my battle cry. Right, Joe? So I went home and I prayed about it and I talked to some friends and I talked to a pastor of mine. This guy here, this guy's a rock, Pastor Toby Quirk, former battalion commander, Green Beret, turned pastor. Talk about a change of profession. And, and I ran this by him and I ran it through a lot of other people. And I figured out this is what we need to do. So I went to some like-minded individuals and I said, listen, I've got a concept and an idea of the One Call Away Foundation. And I said, I'd like you to help me do this. Would you come on board and be with me on this walk? And they all said, every single one of them said, yes. And we started the One Call Away Foundation. Our job at One Call Away is to find every resource available 
to supply the needs of a veteran is going to distress in any shape, form, or fashion. My job is to be that man, that guy in the light or in the dark, that when they're on their hands and knees and at the end of the rope, to be that voice that says, you know, there's a better way. And I've had to do it. I've taken guns away, ropes away, knives away. I've been out 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning. I've been called in by the Massachusetts State Police and every law enforcement around my hometown. Because they know that I have a compassion and a conviction to make sure that nobody else is going to sit on the hood of that car at 2.30 in the morning looking at a bog, thinking that there's not going to be another day. I found out that I've learned through going to different training programs and, and putting myself in front of people who had the information I needed to get. One of them being John, by the way. He walked by me early today and I went, damn, I know him. <laughs> John and I went on the General's Alliance for the Behavioral Health of the Mass National Guard. And I learned so much from this guy in just the three, the three or four times we got together before COVID killed us. And, and, we, and, and, and the man's got some commitment. So we develop, we develop ways of dealing with situations that we're going through. So when I get a phone call from, from an law enforcement, from an EMT provider, I have people in different places that listen to scanners and whatnot, and a Massachusetts State Police called me directly to get there because they found out that we had a symposium a few years back similar to this at Bay State where we taught first responders, medical professionals, both in the, in the, in the hospital and out in the field, the EMTs, how to deal with a veteran that's going through distress and, and how to chit chat and talk with them. And I first learned that concept by a man named Jimmy Hatch. Jimmy Hatch was a SEAM TL6 operator. I went to a symposium in 2016 who, who taught on dealing with PTSD and how he was one of the ones that was part of the Bagal rescue attempt there. He got shot up, blew out his femur. He talked about going from an asset to an instant liability and that he had gotten home and dealing with PTSD and had his 9 millimeter out and picked out the perfect dumpster and he was getting ready to go out and end it. And, and as he was getting ready to lose it, he walked out the front door and there was three police officers in the front because his wife had called him and called the base. The cops walked up, saw the, the situation he was in and immediately identified the fact that, you know what, this isn't a legal matter. This is a mental matter for military personnel. You, the cop walked up to him and said, sir, you don't need us. We're going to hang here till your buddies get here. And this buddy showed up and got him to a place where he needed to be. So that's what we do at One Call Away. I'll come out to the field where I'll work, I'll meet with the officers and the person that's having a hard time. We'll have some quiet talks, sometimes 10 minutes, sometimes an hour and a half, and get that man to get to a position where he can become compliable and he wants to get some help, and then take him by the hand and bring him where he needs to be, and then stay by his side during the trip. I spent 8, 9, 10, 12 hours in the emergency room since I closed the Leeds emergency room waiting to get seen by somebody so I can get him transferred where he needed to be. But I can't leave because what if? What if I walk away and he takes the door? What if all of a sudden I'm not there and he says, wait a minute, he said he was going to be there. Apparently nobody does care. So that's how we trained ourselves to do it. You find out what's going on. And you get that through normal conversation. He'll tell you what's happening. If you keep your mouth shut long enough and listen, you'll hear it. You know, there's a book out there, Slow to Speak, Quick to Listen, or the other way around. My wife made me read that when we first got married. Boy, did I learn a lot. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's that commitment that we make to, to finding out what's going on with them. And then by, by, by trials and tribulations that we've been through in our organization, we collected the resources and locations in which to get them to. So each individual who's different and unique, we can move them to exactly where they need to go, but we walk alongside them. If I can't, I have somebody else who can. And handoff is honesty. I've had conversations with others where I'll have a veteran on one phone, I'll have another, another, another provider on another phone, and they've got somebody else on another phone trying to line something up to get something going on to get this guy moving in the right direction. And I go, well, I can't totally identify with what you're doing, but I got a friend who can. Let me introduce you to him. I'll bring you to him. You talk to him, and we'll help get you where you need to be. This is how you walk in and, and talk it. You know, if you just tell somebody you need to get help and turn around and walk away, he's not going to get the help. You need to be willing to pick him up and carry him to where he needs to be. That's what's going to work. And that's what's going to help drop these numbers down. It's taking an active vested role in somebody else's life. It's not easy. It's going to hurt. I've cried home many, many nights. I can't tell you how many times where I'll leave a situation after hours and I'm emotionally drained. But I, got, I was given a lot of information a long time ago, and one of them is a mentorship. 
I have mentors. I have mentors for my business. I have mentors for my personal life. I have a mentor for my spiritual life. And I have a mentorship for what I do with One Call Away. So I, get, I start traveling home. I get on the phone. I make some quick phone calls. And I take care of myself. Because I can't carry everything. If I do, I will kill myself. So after dealing with somebody, you know, there was one case up in Huntington, an hour and a half in the field after taking a 9 millimeter away from a first sergeant, three tours. You know, what he saw, what he did, and what he spilled on me, I carried. And I had to, you know, in order to keep myself from getting hurt, I get on the phone, I make some phone calls, I talk to my mentors, give it to them, I don't have to carry it anymore. You know, these are the things we learn and we do. And this is what we this is what we believe in in one call away. And that's why the name popped up. One call away. If you need us, give us a call. We're coming one way or another. If, if I can't get there, I know somebody who can. Kind of babbled on a bit. He told me I only had a couple of quick minutes, and the general is uh, pretty pretty strict on his rules. But I wanted to give you everything in a nutshell. I only wanted to come here today and and and, uh, and listen. And I was asked if I would spend a few minutes up here. And I'm pretty glad I did, uh, because every time I tell you something. I remind me of what I need to do in my world. And believe it or not, in this last five minutes, I just recommitted myself to one call away. And I appreciate your time. Thank you, David. Um, and <clears throat> You know, I'm pleased that there is another Cold War veteran in the room. There are many of us out there, David, so uh, we got some solidarity. And uh, in my case, it was very cold. So uh, thank you. Anyway, um, coming in, we're, we're honored to have all the way from Arizona, I should say by the miracle of modern technology, Mr. John Dooley, who is... Um, a Vietnam veteran and uh, someone who has a very interesting personal story to tell us. So, uh, Mr. Dooley, we're honored to have you. And uh, by Zoom, we, uh, we are honored to have you with us this morning. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, hey, good morning to everybody from Arizona. Uh, I'm up here and we've had our first snow already. Have you had your first snow there in Massachusetts yet? No. No, well, we beat you to it. Uh, I'm at 7,000 feet up here in Flagstaff, and I'm calling you from on a bright sunny morning. Uh, wonderful here. Uh, how do you like the show so far? Is everything going well for you? Are you getting your questions answered? Thanks for coming. This is our team. This is our emergency response team for Massachusetts. And I wish I could be there in person, but this is what happened, and here I am. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, hopefully we can give you some tools that you need today, some resources. Uh, and this is my hometown. Uh, I'm from Otter River, Massachusetts. I'm living in Arizona now, but my heart is with you guys today. And I appreciate what you're doing, all of you. Uh, look around you. Stop and look around. Look at the people who are sitting there or standing there next to you. Uh, look at them. And I'm going to ask you today to do everything you can to connect with all of those people. OK, give cards, get cards, look around, shake hands, give high signs to people, take them out of the room and meet with them. Uh, and before you leave, I want you to have a whole bunch of cards, a whole bunch of resources, more than you had when you walked in here. So this is where we are today. We are in a place where we have more veteran suicides than ever. We need to intervene. I am speaking from personal from personal story, I have been one of those veterans who has been suicidal after coming home from Vietnam. Uh, my life kind of went to shit, and I dealt with it as best I could, but I didn't know where to go. Uh, some people in my family, uh, my dad, uh, who's a World War II vet, my grandfather, who was a Purple Heart in World War I, saw something was really weird about me, and they were right. I had just come from Da Nang, 35 rockets on the day I left, and my barracks got blown up. I mean, it was just it was just absolutely crazy. And I came home to no more marriage uh, and death. So I was in a really tough spot. And they were tuned in enough to me to be able to say, hey, something's wrong with you. We're taking you to someplace. And I remember the guy. They took me to the basement of the 
city building in Wichita, town building in Wichita, Massachusetts. And I spoke with William Strott. And William Strott in 1973 was the veterans coordinator for, the, for Worcester County. And they set up an appointment. I got right over to Hanscom Field. I got myself set up with a counselor. It was a jump start. I wasn't, I wasn't cured instantly. Everything didn't go well instantly. What did happen, though, is I began to have some hope. And I began to have some direction for being a brand new minted civilian, separated from my unit, uh, starting a new life. And that's the big thing that we need to do. We need to instill hope into people. We need to instill that we're there with them. We need to instill that we can actually make this together. I'm going to ask the promoters uh, for my heart's in this. I'm going to ask the promoters for this event to uh, please uh, post somehow my contact information, jwdooley at cox.net. Uh, my my uh, loyalty is with you. I do this kind of work. I still do. Uh, I'm a licensed, prevent, uh, licensed professional counselor in the state of Arizona. Uh, I've worked uh, extensively overseas and in the U.S. with active duty military, with their families. Uh, a lot in the last 12 years, we've had a lot of people who have deployed unexpectedly and deployed for years. Uh, so we've got people who have deployed seven, eight, and nine times. Uh, I've worked with reserve families. The reserve, if you're out there, uh, thank you. I've worked with reserve families who have really carried a lot of the weight of our past military engagements and who have virtually no services available from the state. They come home, they don't, they lose their group just like we did in Vietnam, and they're out there at large. Some of them don't have any service benefits or military benefits at all. We need to reach out to those people. Uh, I've worked for the Vet Center. Uh, the Vet Center is a subsidiary of the Veterans Administration specifically designed for suicide response, specifically designed for outpatient counseling uh, away from a hospital model. Uh, did that for nine years. Uh, I do disaster response uh, with the Red Cross and with community organizations. I work with the homeless and I work with the tribes. Here we have the, the primaries are Tohono Autumn, the Apache, the Navajo, and uh, I'm welcome. I go to the sweats, I go to the fires, I go to the talking circles and I meet with them. Uh, so I have been under bridges, <laughs> I get called to emergency rooms, I get called by SWAT teams, and uh, I just really enjoy this kind of work. Uh, this has been my career now for, well, since 1972, since 1973 when I got back. Uh, I'm going to talk with you a little bit today about resiliency training, and if you are familiar with it, that's great. If you're not familiar with resiliency training, I want to our network, which we have now from this, this type of event, I'd like us to put out more about resiliency training and what it is. Uh, and there's four facets of it. There's emotional, there's cognitive and mental, there's physical, and there's spiritual resiliency. Resiliency is your ability to bounce back from a tough time. Uh, my friend Bobby Bronson, as some of you may know, he was a boxer. And Bobby and I used to practice together. Mostly, I was the punching bag and Bobby was the guy that was punching. And you couldn't even see him, he was so fast. But Bobby taught me to duck, he taught me to weave, he taught me to be lighter on my feet so he couldn't get me because he wanted to get better. So what I'm saying to you is that this resiliency training you can bring to people, it's a preventative. And it can help people that you work with in your field. I can present this. I will be in Massachusetts. I'm, I'm coming out there in the next couple of months. I'd be happy to connect with any of you or your organizations. Um, I guess uh, I'm looking at some of the ways that we can connect with veterans. We are by nature, largely, not all of us, but hermits. And uh, I've noticed that when we hurt, because of the lessons that we got in the military, we're taught to suck it up we're taught to stay in line. We're taught to close ranks. We're taught to not think about whatever happened to us before. We're taught to not talk about it. And the military still uh, is uh, in that ilk. They're learning now. What I did as a military and family counselor, uh, traveling all around the world, I was in Japan and Germany and England and a lot of places in the States, was that I was out of command because I was a consultant for a Department of Defense agency, I could sit in Taco Bell, I could sit in the food court on a base, 
and I would introduce myself to people. I'd walk around and pass out my cards. But people were afraid to talk because if you spoke about what was going on with you in a military setting, you could lose your stripes. You could lose a chance of promotion. You could not be able to re-enlist. Uh, and so there's a tremendous code of silence that, that exists in the military. We are the people that are breaking that. We're starting by saying, welcome home. We're starting by finding out who we are. If you're a veteran, stand up. If you're a veteran, let us know who you are. If you're a veteran, come to these events and these organizations and encourage people how to do it. I want to tell you a little bit about the way we introduce this resiliency training. We do it really gradually. We are out in the community. We use news uh, events uh, about organizations like this, about events like this. We get interviewed whenever we can. Uh, and that's what I'm doing today. I'm not working for an organization right now. I work for myself. I'm an independent contractor with the Department of Defense. I'm a licensed professional counselor, like I said. Uh, we do sweat lodges uh, for the Native Americans here. And we, have, we go to car shows. Uh, we do stand downs. And if you're not familiar with a stand down, a stand down effectively is a an event where you can show up if you're whoever you are, you can show up. And if you have a dog, if you're homeless and you have a dog unhomed and you have a dog, you can show up with your dog. We have people who will take care of your dog, who will clip its claws, who will who will bathe your dog, who will flea dip it, who will really give it a total spa treatment. <laughs> you probably recognize your dog when you're gone because when we're homeless, our dogs are our people. And when we're hermits, our dogs are our people, our animals are our people. While your dog's getting done, you too are getting done. We can do your clothes. We can get you some new clothes. We can get you hooked up with a veterans benefit coordinator. We can get you, uh, you know, just, just cleaned up in every imaginable way. We have workshops for the whole time. And you don't go home at night. You stay with us. And you're treated in a hotel kind of a way. You're not in a pen someplace. You're treated like a dignified human being. These are held at the VA a couple times a year. Uh, so that's one, another kind of outreach that we do. We do outreach on radio and television. We do outreach on Skype. If you look at YouTube and you look under veterans suicide, you will see a whole bunch of uh, resources that you can easily train yourself on. Um, we do events that are uh, called dog tag events. So a lot of us remember, I mean, is there anybody here that was in the military that didn't get dog tags when they came in? No. Well, what do dog tags signify? Dog tags signify that you are going to go someplace where you're going to, your life is going to be in danger. No matter what happens after this, you're going to have these dog tags. And what happens is that oh, a lot of us lose them. I've misplaced mine and everything. But it's kind of an honoring ceremony to get somebody these dog tags, to, to, be, to meet with them. Uh, again, the Hermit Club events. Uh, we do Hermit Club events. And the Hermit, I'm, I'm a vet center, I've been a vet center counselor for 10 years. Uh, the Hermit Club events are events for people that don't normally mix. And they can look like free veterans health clinics. Uh, they can look like spread the event. Uh, so for a lot of us, getting your blood pressure taken, getting your vitals taken, having somebody test your hearing, there are a lot of people who will set those, who will come forward if you start to organize those things. Uh, subgroups, uh, the subgroups of people that we have to work with, uh, that are our resources, we, have, we need outreach. We have outreach for our women veterans. We have outreach for people who are coming out of some kind of a, uh, a trauma. We have people that meet folks on the planes, uh, that, that come, off, come back home from the planes. I know for me, when I came back, the first months, the first weeks coming home, I didn't really know how to connect with other people. I didn't know how to find veterans. I didn't know how to, uh, to speak with them. I had all these acronyms, these little crazy little letters about what I did, but nobody else was going to understand them because they weren't from my unit. Uh, it took me a while to find other veterans. Uh, when I did, I got invested with a veterans affairs office at the University of Massachusetts. Guess who was there? Veterans who were caring, 
veterans who were in the same kind of boat as me, work studies who were struggling their way through school with me. We started working on each other's cars together and we started listening to each other. We formed groups of people that would go places together, meet people, and as soon as we could, this is really early on in the veterans movement, uh, after the Vietnam War, as soon as we could, we started forming orientations for people who are coming home. And that's what we need to do. I'd like to open this up for questions. Uh, I've thrown a lot of things out really quickly. Uh, I appreciate being here. Do any of you have anything to say, any questions? I can't see you, but I would love to hear what you, what you have to say to me. Thank you very much, Mr. Dooley, for joining us. And you hit the nail on the head. So, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our, our first set of speakers. And I'd like to invite anyone who has questions uh, sitting out there for any of our folks who are up here. Or, uh, Mr. Julie, if you would uh, step up to the microphone and, and we'll hear your question. Anybody? While we're doing that, I'm going to fill some of the space. How do you contact veterans who are suicidal? I have lost a number of them. I've lost friends and I've lost veterans who wanted to get to me who have been able, unable to. One of the ways I've connected, if there's questions, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely defer to those. One of, the, one of the ways I've met those people is that I've gone out on the SWAT teams and you have to let the people know that who you are and what you're doing. But I went out with SWAT teams, and the SWAT teams would be in a place where they're in a stand down with somebody. And sometimes they just bring somebody cigarettes and bring them a Coke and start talking. Bobby, give me a high sign if there's folks that have questions. Is this working? Um, yep. We have a question. Okay, are we on? Okay. John, they're looking for your contact information. Looking for your contact yeah. information. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, contact information. Could you give us that, please? Yes. J W Dooley D O O L E Y at Cox.net. Uh, as I said, I mean, I'm this. My heart's in this. My heart's been in this for a long time. I think we're still brothers and sisters. I think we're still in units together. I think that this is our unit right now. The people who are in this room for listening to me and talking with me today. We are the people who are a unit of people who want to stay. What did you do in the war? I was not a hero. I was trying to stay alive, and then I was trying to stay alive and keep my friends alive. First, we take care of ourselves. We report out. We form units. We form hermits clubs. We form groups of people. Having done that, we get, we get those people to organize for our own benefits, we can become a voting block. We can become a block of people who are supporting one another and trying to get ourselves services. We can approach political entities to try to get us things that we need. What we really need, though, is locally. If you're looking, and by all means, Bobby, raise your hand if there's questions. If, there, if, if you are in a position where you are working with somebody, find out if they're a veteran. It only takes a little while. I just got, I start talking a little bit about my service. I said, is there anybody here in the Navy? And people will go, oh, you know, and, and, uh, and I'll say, well, what were you in? You know, or I have another one that I do. What's your MOS? If you don't know what an MOS is, military occupational specialty, okay? Most enlisted people who are in the military got above the rate of E2 or E3, we're assigned a military occupational specialty. The Navy does not have them. But if somebody, if somebody is telling you, if you, so if somebody says 88 Mike, well, 88 Mike is a, is a truck driver. Let me tell you something. Nobody knows all the MOSs. That's a little secret. So if somebody tells you the next thing you want to do, and it draws people out instantly, is you want to say, I don't remember that one. That wasn't in my unit. What did you do? I drove a tanker truck with fuel through a combat zone. Wow, that must have been incredibly tough. Was it dangerous? <laughs> yeah, it was really dangerous. Uh, and, you know, sometimes, you know, the guy in front of me, the, 
hit an IED, you know, and what's an IED? Oh, it's an explosive device. It's a, and, and so, and how are you doing with that? Welcome home. God, I'm glad you made it back here. You are? I don't know. I don't feel that way all the time. I have some survivor guilt. You know, I, I should have, it should have been me. I should have been there. I should have been standing that watch. That guy took my watch. And it's like, I'm here. I'm here right today. I'm here to tell you, welcome home. I want to help you get through this and get back home because you know why? We need you. Who knows when it's going to be me? I need you to step up. And I need, I need to see you whole. Thank you, Mr. Dooley. Thanks for those words of inspiration. And I have to say this, <laughs> I was an 88 Mike to start off my career. So that's music to my ears. Ladies and gentlemen, it does not appear we have any questions. So this concludes our first round of speakers.